Hello there. William Golding again. At this point, you should have finished reading chapter one on your own. I'd like to discuss a few things before we move on to chapter two. As I mentioned earlier, Ralph, Jack, and Simon go on an expedition to look at what is really going on on the island. At this point, these three characters decide that they are going to climb the mountain that's there, just above the scar. And once they get to the top of the mountain, they are able to see all the way around the island. They know for a fact that they are on an island. They discover a few things about the island, such as they see that there is the reef that basically encircles most of the island. Again, you can look at the picture here, a map of the island, things that the boys notice while they're up on the top of the mountain. There's the location of the scar where the plane crashed. Then there's the reef that's out there in the sea, and the, the purpose of the reef is to provide some safety from the crushing waves of the Pacific Ocean. Also want you to notice that they locate a region on the island which we are going to call Castle Rock and that's located on your map as well. The Castle Rock is a place where there's actually a second island forming off the main island and eventually, over time, perhaps millions of years, that uh, this will actually become a second island once the land bridge that connects the two uh, locations uh, eventually erodes into the sea. You can see that location there. From a distance, it looks like a castle. It's just basically a, a pile of rocks that are formed on this particular uh, part of the island it makes it look like a castle from a distance. The boys will refer to it as the Castle Rock. Uh, on the boys' journey back from the top of the mountain, they discovered that there are some large stones of granite, some large boulders of granite. One, two, three. And they are successful in rolling one of those into the abyss of the forest. What the boys also discover is that there's lots of sticky green fruit that they can consume. But also, on their way back, they discover that there are pigs on the island. And Jack gets the idea that he would like to hunt and kill pigs to give them protein. And uh, once they get back to the camp where all the boys are waiting for them to hear about news about their expedition. As we begin chapter two, we need to write an essential question for our notes. The essential question for this chapter is, what does the conch symbolize? I've made it pretty clear as the writer of this book, that I tried my best to include symbols. And as we have discussed in the past, symbols are an important part of relating ideas into tangible symbols. So in other words, when we think about an abstract idea, we want to associate that abstract idea with the idea of something that's concrete, something that you can sense with your five senses in order to define that abstract idea. The conch is going to work in a similar way. As we read chapter two, I want you to keep track of some of the things that happen in this chapter and consider what I'm attempting to communicate with the symbol of the conch. Chapter 2 Fire on the Mountain By the time that Ralph had finished blowing the conch, the platform was crowded. 
There were differences between this meeting and the one held earlier in the morning. The afternoon sun had slanted in from the other side of the platform, and most of the children, feeling too late the smart of sunburn, had put their clothes on. The choir, less of a group, had discarded their cloaks. Ralph sat on a fallen trunk, his left side to the sun. On his right were most of the choir, and on his left, the larger boys, who had not known each other before the evacuation, before him, small children squatted in the grass. Okay, so I want you to notice that at the beginning of this chapter, we kind of have this situation with isolated groups. So on one side of Rolf is the choir. The other side is some of the older children. And right in front of them, in their own distinct group, is the smaller children, who are going to be known as Litlins uh, later on in this book. So I want you to notice that there are three distinct groups that are part of this meeting, with the conch being used to summon them to this particular meeting. Silence now. Ralph lifted the cream and pink shell to his knees, and a sudden breeze scattered light over the platform. He was uncertain whether to stand up or remain sitting. He looked sideways to his left, toward the bathing pool. Piggy was sitting near, but giving no help. Ralph cleared his throat. <clears throat> well then... All at once, he found that he could talk fluently and explain what he had to say. He passed his hand through his fair hair and he spoke. We're on an island. We've been on the mountaintop and seen water all around. We saw no houses, no smoke, no footprints, no boats, no people. We're on an uninhabited island with no other people on it. Then Jack broke in. All the same, you need an army for hunting, hunting pigs. Yes, there are pigs on the island. All three of them tried to convey the sense of the pink live thing struggling in the creepers. We saw squealing. It broke away before I could kill it. But next time, Jack slammed his knife into a trunk and looked round challengingly. The meeting settled down again. So you see, said Rolf, we need hunters to get us meat. And another thing. He lifted the shell on his knees and looked round at the sun slashed faces. There aren't any grown ups. We shall ha have to look after ourselves. The meeting hummed and was silent. And another thing, we can't have everybody talking at once. We shall have to put our hands up like we do at school. He held the conch before his face and he glanced round the mouth. Then I'll give him the conch. Conch? That's what the shell's called. I'll give the conch to the next person to speak. He can hold it while he's speaking. Okay, so again, look at the essential question. Ralph is clarifying the rules. And if you think back to your true color notes, this is one of those moments where we can sort to start to identify different color characteristics. So as you have noted uh, before in the past, that people who tend to follow the rules, people who are very procedural, are typically this gold type of character. As Rolf is displaying this, uh, and he's using the conch as a symbol, uh, he's used it to call the meeting. He's now going to use the conch as a method of choosing who gets to speak next. Sort of a democratic type of situation. So democracy, leadership, authority, 
all these ideas, these abstract ideas, are being presented to you by Rolf through the conch. So begin to kind of jot down some ideas about what you think the conch symbolizes or represents. He held the conch before his face and glanced round the mouth. Then I'll give him the conch. Conch? That's what this shell's called. I'll give the conch to the next person to speak, and he can hold it when he's speaking. But, and look, he won't be interrupted, except by me. Jack was on his feet. We'll have rules, he cried excitedly. Lots of rules, and when anyone breaks them... Okay, so again, notice, Ralph is the leader. He's been voted chief. He's trying to use the conch as a symbol of power, authority, democracy, all these things. But look how Jack is trying to express his leadership. Uh, he wants to establish rules on the island, yes. However, when people break the rules, he's the one that wants to deal out the punishment. We'll have rules! He cried excitedly, lots of rules. And then when anyone breaks them, we are wacko bong doink. Ralph felt the conch lifted from his lap. And then Piggy was standing, cradling the great cream shell and shouting, and the shouting died down. Jack left on his feet, looked uncertainly at Ralph, who smiled and patted the log. In other words, giving a clue to Jack that it's time now for him to sit and listen. Because Piggy has the conch. Piggy took off his glasses and he blinked at the assembly while he wiped them on his shirt. You're not letting Ralph get to the most important thing. Who knows we're here? Nobody knows we're here. Perhaps they knew where we were going to. Perhaps not. But they don't know where we are now, because we never got there. He gaped at them for a moment, and then he swayed and sat down, and Ralph took the conch from his hands. That's what I was going to say, he went on, when all you all... He gazed at their intent faces. The plane was shot down in flames. Nobody knows where we are. We may be here for a long time. The silence was so complete that they could hear the unevenness of Piggy's breathing. The sun slanted in and lay golden over half the platform. The breezes on the lagoon had chased their tails like kittens and were finding their way across the platform and into the forest. Ralph pushed back the tangle of his fair hair that hung at his forehead. So we may be here for a long time. Nobody said anything. And then he grinned suddenly. But this is a good island. We, Jack, Simon and me, we climb the mountain. It's wizard. There's food and drink. Okay, I want to stop here for a moment. Notice this change in mood. Piggy starts off with the idea that they are stranded, stuck, that they may be here for a long time. And Ralph attempts to calm the situation by trying to change the mood, talking about the island, that the island is a good island. Now, I'm being intentional here, and I want to make something very clear. I chose on purpose a deserted, tropical island. Uh, I chose on purpose to place these boys, who we would assume are innocent children, all under the age of about... Twelve and a half. 
and I dropped them off on this deserted tropical island paradise for a reason. And I want you to notice that Ralph calls this island good. Now, I know I'm going to be controversial, and I'm going to make the statement that if you read the book of Genesis uh, in the Bible, the creation story, and when God created the heavens and the earth, and created the Garden of Eden, he declared those places good. And when he placed man in the Garden of Eden, he declared Adam to be good. And then he created Eve, and he declared Eve to be good. And the two became one flesh, and lived their lives on this particular place in this island, so to speak, this Garden of Eden. But when they sinned against God and committed evil, they were banished from the Garden of Eden. And they were no longer good because of their evil. I'm making a point here. Please watch this as the novel develops into its themes. That this island is good. It has all the fruit that they need. It has even pigs for them to hunt. But what makes the island not so good? Is that what we are doing to our planet? That God has so richly given to us and that we are to care for it. But instead of caring for it, instead we do very evil, selfish, terrible things and it's having an impact on our world. Consider that. Piggy, partly recovered, pointed to the conch in Ralph's hands, and Jack and Simon fell silent. And Ralph went on. And while we're waiting, we can have a good time on this island. He gesticulated wildly. It's like in that book. At once there was a clamor. Treasure Island! Swallows and Amazons! Coral Island! Ralph waved the conch. This is our island. It's a good island. Until the grown-ups come to fetch us, we'll have fun. Jack held out his hands for the conch. There's pigs, he said. There's food and bathing water and that little stream along there and everything. Didn't anyone find anything else? He handed the conch back to Ralph and sat down. Apparently no one had found anything. The older boys first noticed the child when he resisted. There was a group of little boys urging him to move forward, and he did not want to go. He was a shrimp of a boy, about six years old, and on one side of his face was blotted out by a mulberry-colored birthmark. He stood now, warped out of the perpendicular by the fierce light of publicity, and he bowled into the coarse grass with one toe. He was muttering and about to cry. The other little boys, whispering but serious, pushed him toward Ralph. We are going to notice a change of mood at this point with this little boy with the mulberry colored birthmark on his face. And he is going to attempt to represent the concerns that the little boys sitting in front of Ralph all share. Even though Ralph is trying to paint this island as a good island and a nice island and a place that's safe and, and has everything that they need to survive, something's going to come up to change the mood. All right, said Ralph. Come on, then. 
the small boy looked round in panic. Well, speak up! The small boy held out his hands for the conch, and the assembly shouted with laughter. At once, he snatched back his hands and started to cry. Let him have the conch! shouted Piggy. Let him have it! At last, Ralph induced him to hold the shell, but by then the blow of laughter had taken away the child's voice, and Piggy knelt by him, one hand on the great shell, listening and interpreting to the assembly. He wants to know what you're going to do about the snake thing. Ralph laughed, and the other boys laughed with him. The small boy twisted further into himself. Well, tell us about the snake thing. <laughs> now he says it was a beastie. Beastie? <laughs> a snake thing, ever so big. He saw it. When? when he was hiding in the jungle in the dark. Either wandering breezes, or perhaps the decline of the sun, allowed a little coolness to lie under the trees, and the boys felt it and stirred restlessly. Again, notice with the change of the mood, we have a change of temperature, cold, icy breeze. Well, you couldn't have a beastie, a snake thing on an island this size. Ralph explained kindly. You only get them in big countries like Africa or India. Murmur and the grave nodding of heads. He says the beastie came in the dark. Well, then he couldn't see it. Laughter and cheers. Did you hear that? Says he saw the thing in the dark. He still says he saw the beastie. It came and went away again and came back and wanted to eat him. He was dreaming, laughing. Ralph looked for confirmation round the ring of faces. The older boys agreed. But here and there, among the little ones, was the doubt that required more than rational assurance. He must have had a nightmare, stumbling about among all them creepers. More grave nodding. They knew about nightmares. He says he saw the beastie and the snake thing, and will it come back again tonight? But there isn't a beastie! He says in the morning it turned into them things like ropes in the trees and hung in the branches. He says, will it come back tonight? But there isn't a beastie! There was no longer laughter at all now and more grave watching. Ralph pushed both his hands through his hair, and he looked at the little boy in mixed amusement and exasperation. Jack sees the conch. Ralph's right, of course. There isn't a snake thing. But if there was a snake, we'd hunt it and kill it. We're going to hunt pigs and get meat for everybody, and then we'll look for the snake too. But there isn't a snake! We'll make sure when we go hunting. Ralph was annoyed and for a moment defeated. Okay, now watch what happens. Ralph is asserting his authority. He says there is not a beast. But Jack tries to usurp this authority by saying, Yes, there isn't a beast. But if there is, I'm the one that's going to save you. I'm the one that's going to protect you. Not Ralphie boy here. Do you see this conflict starting to develop for leadership and control on the island? Something he had not known was there rose in him and compelled him to make this point loudly again. But I tell you, there isn't a beast! The assembly was silent. Ralph lifted the conch again, and his good humor came back, and he thought of what he had to say next. 
And now we come to the most important thing. I've been thinking. I was thinking while we were climbing the mountain. He flashed a conspiratorial grin at the other two. And on the beach just now. And this is what I thought. We want to have fun. And we want to be rescued. The passionate noise of agreement from the assembly hit him like a wave and he lost his thread and he thought again. We want to be rescued and of course we shall be rescued. Voices babbled. This simple statement, unbacked by any proof but the weight of Ralph's new authority, brought light and happiness and he had to wave the conch before he could make them hear him. My father's in the navy... He said that there aren't any unknown islands left. He says the Queen has a big room full of maps and all the islands in the world are drawn there. So the Queen's got a picture of this island. Again came sounds of cheerfulness and better heart. And sooner or later, a ship will put in here. It might even be Daddy's ship. So you see, sooner or later, we shall be rescued. He paused with his point made. The assembly was lifted towards safety by his words. They liked and now respected him. And spontaneously, they began to clap. And presently, the platform was loud with applause. Ralph flushed, looking sideways at Piggy's open admiration. And then the other way, at Jack, who was smirking and showing he too knew how to clap. Ralph waved the conch. Shut up! Wait! Listen! He went on in silence, born in his triumph. There's another thing. If a ship comes near the island, they may not notice us. So we must make smoke on top of the mountain. We must make a fire. Come on! Follow me! So again, Ralph comes up with this brilliant idea. But who is going to lead this? Who's going to lead the execution of Ralph's idea? It's going to be Jack. And why is he doing it? Again, he's attempting to usurp his authority over Ralph. Watch for this. The space under the palm trees was full of noise and movement. Ralph was on his feet too, shouting for quiet, but no one heard him. All at once the crowd swayed toward the island and was gone, following Jack. Even the tiny children went and did their best among the leaves and broken branches. Ralph was left holding the conch, with no one but Piggy. Piggy's breathing was quite restored. Just like kids. Like a crowd of kids. I bet it's gone tea time. What do they think they're going to do on top of that mountain? He caressed the shell respectfully. And then he stopped and looked up. Ralph! Hey! Where are you going? Ralph had already clambered over his first smashed swaths of the scar. A long way ahead of him was crashing and laughter. Piggy watched him in disgust. Like a crowd of kids. He sighed, bent up, laced up his shoes. Then noise of the errant assembly faded up the mountain. And then the martyred expression of a parent who has to keep up with the senseless ebullience of the children picked up the conch, turned toward the forest and began to pick his way over the tumbled scar. Below the other side of the mountain top was a platform of forest. Once more... Ralph found himself making a cupping gesture. Down there, we can get as much wood as we want. Jack nodded and pulled at his underlip, starting perhaps a hundred feet below them on the steeper side of the mountain. A patch might have been designed expressly for fuel. Trees forced by the damp heat found too little soil for full growth, fell early and decayed. Creepers cradled them and new saplings searched a way up. Jack turned to the choir who stood ready. The black caps of maintenance were slid over their ear like berets. We'll build a pile, come on! They found the likeliest path down and began tugging at the dead wood. 
and the small boys who had reached the top came sliding too until everyone but Piggy was busy. Most of the wood was so rotten that when they pulled it, it broke up into a shower of fragments and wood lice and decay, but some of the trunks came out in one piece. The twins, Sam and Eric, were the first to get to the likely log, but they could do nothing until Ralph, Jack, Simon, Roger, and Morris found room for a hold on. And then they inched the grotesque dead thing up to the rock and toppled it over the top. Each party of boys added a quota, less or more, and the pile grew. And at the return, Ralph found himself alone on a limb with Jack, and they grinned at each other, sharing this burden. And once more, amid the breeze and shouting, and the slanting sunlight on the high mountain, was shed that glamour, the strange invisible light of friendship, adventure, and content. Almost too heavy, Jack grinned back. Not for the two of us. And together, joined in an effort by this burden, they staggered up the steep of the mountain. Together, they chanted, One, two, three, and crashed the log onto the great pile. And then they stepped back, laughing with triumphant pleasure. So immediately, Ralph had to stand on his head. Below them, boys were still laboring, though some of the small ones had lost interest and were searching this new forest for fruit. And now the twins unsuspecting intelligence came up the mountain with armfuls of dried leaves and dumped them against the pile and one by one they sensed that the pile was complete and the boys stopped going back for more and stood with the pink shattered top of the mountain around them breath came evenly by now and the sweat dried ralph and jack looked at each other while society paused about them then the shameful knowledge grew in them they did not know how to begin confession. Ralph spoke first, crimson in the face. Will you? He cleared his throat <clears throat> and went on. Will you light the fire? And now the absurd situation was in the open. And Jack blushed too. And he began to mutter vaguely. Will you rub two st- Dicks, you rub. He glanced at Ralph, who blurted out this last confession of incompetence. Has anyone got any matches? Wait, you make the bow and spin the arrow, said Roger, and he rubbed his hands in mime. Bzz, 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 bzz. A little air was moving over the mountain. Piggy came with it in shorts and shirt, laboring cautiously out of the forest with the evening sunlight gleaming from his glasses. He held the conch under his arm. Ralph shouted at him, Piggy, have you got any matches? The other boys took up the cry until the mountain rang. Piggy shook his head and came to the pile. My, you've made a big heap, haven't you? Jack pointed suddenly. His specs! Use them as burning glasses! Piggy was surrounded before he could back away. Here, let me go! His voice rose to a shriek of terror as Jack snatched the glasses off his face. Mind out! Give them back! I can hardly see! You'll break the conch! Ralph elbowed him to one side and knelt by the pile. Stand out of the light! There was pushing and pulling and officious cries. Ralph moved the lenses back and forth, this way and that, until the glossy white image of the declining sun lay against a piece of rotten wood. Almost at once, a thin trickle of smoke rose up and made him cough. Jack knelt too and blew gently so that the smoke drifted away, thickening, and a tiny flame appeared. The flame, nearly invisible at first, in the bright sunlight, enveloped a small twig, grew, and was enriched with color, and reached up the branch, which exploded with a sharp crack. The flame flapped higher, and the boys broke into cheer. My specs! howled Piggy. Give me back my specs! Ralph stood away from the pile and put the glasses in Piggy's groping hands, and his voice subsided to a mutter. Just blurs, that's all. 
can hardly see my hand. The boys were dancing. The pa was so rotten and now so tender dry that whole limbs yielded passionately to the yellow flames that poured upwards and shook a great beard of flame twenty feet in the air. For yards round the fire the heat was like a blow and the breeze was a river of sparks. Trunks crumbled to white dust. Ralph shouted, More wood! All of you, get more wood! And life became a race with the fire. And the boys scattered through the upper forest. To keep a clean flag of flame flying on the mountain was immediate end, and no one looked further. Even the smallest boys, unless fruit claimed them, brought little pieces of wood and threw them in. The air moved a little faster and became a light wind, so that the leeward and windward side were clearly differentiated. On one side the air was cool, but on the other the fire thrust out its savage arm of heat and crinkled the hair on the instant. Boys who felt the evening wind on their damp faces paused to enjoy the freshness of it, and then they found that they were exhausted, and they flung themselves down in the shadows that lay among the shattered rocks. The beard of flame diminished quickly, and then the pile fell inwards with a soft, cindery sound and sent a great tree of sparks upward that leaned away and drifted downwind. The boys lay like panting dogs. Ralph raised his head off his forearms. Well, that was no good. Roger spat efficiently into the hot dust. What do you mean? There wasn't any smoke. Only flame. Piggy had settled himself in a space between the two rocks and sat with the conch on his knees. We well, haven't made a fire, he said. What's any use? Couldn't keep a fire like that going, not if we tried. A fat lot you tried, said Jack contemptuously. You just sat. We used his specs, said Simon, smearing a black cheek with his forearm. He helped that way. I got the conch, said Piggy indignantly. You let me speak. Well, the conch doesn't count on top of the mountain, said Jack. So you shut up. I got the conch in my hand. Put on green branches, said Morris. That's the best way to make smoke. I got the conch. Jack turned fiercely. You shut up. Piggy wilted. Ralph took the conch from him and looked round the circle of boys. We got to have special people for looking after the fire. Any day there may be a ship out there. He waved his arms at the top wire of the horizon. And if we can signal, they'll come and take us off. And another thing. We ought to have more rules. Where the conch is, that's a meeting. The same up here as down there. They assented. Piggy opened his mouth to speak, caught Jack's eye and shut it again. Jack held out his hands for the conch and stood up, holding the delicate thing carefully in his sooty hands. I agree with Ralph. Got to have rules and obey them. After all, we're not savages. We're English. And the English are best at everything. So I'll have lots of rules. He turned to Ralph. Ralph, I'll split up my choir, my hunters that is, into groups. And we'll be responsible for keeping the fire going. Okay, you got to get this down into your notes. This is a huge moment. Jack has just volunteered his hunters, his choir, to be responsible for maintaining the fire as a signal for rescue. Now the question is, why? Why is he volunteering to do this? Is it because he wants to be rescued? Or is it because he wants to assert more authority on the island? This generosity brought a spatter of applause from the boys so that Jack grinned at them and then waved the conch for silence. Well, let the fire burn out now. Who would see smoke at night time anyway? And we could start the fire again whenever we like. 
Altos, you can keep the fire going this week and troubles the next. The assembly assented gravely. And we'll be responsible for keeping a lookout too. And if we see a ship out there, they followed the direction of his bony arm with their eyes, we'll put green branches on and then there'll be more smoke. They gazed intently at the dense blue of the horizon as if a little silhouette might appear out there any moment. The sun in the west was a drop of burning gold that slid nearer and nearer to the sill of the world. All at once they were aware of the evening as the end of light and warmth. Roger took the conch and looked round them gloomily. I've been watching the sea. There hasn't been a trace of a ship. Perhaps we'll never get rescued. A mamma rose and swept away. Ralph took back the conch. I said this before. We will be rescued sometime. We just got to wait, that's all. Daring and indignant, Piggy took the conch. That's what I said! I said about our meetings and things, and then you said shut up! His voice lifted into a whine of vitreous recrimination. They stirred and began to shout him down. You said you wanted a small fire, and then you've been and built a pile like a hayrick. And if I say anything, cried Piggy with a bitter realism, you say shut up. But if Jack or Morris or Simon... He paused in the tumult, standing, looking beyond them and down the unfriendly side of the mountain to a great patch where they had found dead wood. And then he laughed so strangely that they were hushed looking at the flash in his spectacles in astonishment. They followed his gaze to find the sour joke. You got your small fire, all right. The smoke was rising here and there among the creepers that festooned the dead and dying trees, and as they watched, a flash of fire appeared at the root of one wisp, and then the smoke thickened. Small flames stood at the trunk of a tree and crawled away through the leaves and the brushwood, dividing and increasing. One patch touched a tree trunk and scrambled up like a bright squirrel. The smoke increased, sifted and rolled outwards. The squirrel leapt on wings of the wind and clung to another standing tree, eating downwards. Beneath the dark canopy of leaves and smoke, the fire laid hold of the forest and began to gnaw. So, in their attempt to start this fire... They actually set the entire forest on fire. Acres of black and yellow smoke rolled steadily toward the sea. At the sight of the flames, the irresistible course of the fire, the boys broke into a shrill, excited cheering. The flames, as though they were a kind of wildlife, crept like a jaguar, creeps on its belly, toward the line of birch-like saplings that fledged an outcrop of the pink rock. They flapped at the first of the trees, and the, and the branches grew a brief foliage of fire. The heart of the flame leapt nimbly across the gap between the trees and went swinging and flaring along the whole row of them. Beneath the capering boys, a quarter-mile quarter square of forest was savage with smoke and flame, the separate noises of the fire emerged into a drum roll that seemed to shake the mountain. You caught your small fire, all right. Startled, Ralph realized the boys were falling still and silent, feeling the beginning of awe at the power set free below them. The knowledge and the awe made him savage. Oh, shut up! I got the conch, said Piggy in a hurt voice. I got the right to speak! They looked at him with eyes that lacked interest in, in what they saw and cocked ears at the drum roll of fire. Piggy glanced nervously into hell and cradled the conch. We got to let that fire burn out now. And that was our firewood. He licked his lips. And there ain't nothing we can do. We ought to be more careful. I'm scared. Jack dragged his eyes away from the fire. You're always scared, you fatty! I got the conch, said Piggy bleakly, and he turned to Ralph. I got the conch, ain't I, Ralph? 
Unwillingly, Ralph turned away from this splendid, awful sight. What's that? The conch! I got the right to speak! The twins giggled together. We wanted smoke! And now look! A pail stretched for miles away from the island, and all the boys except for Piggy started to giggle presently, and they were shrieking with laughter. Piggy lost his temper. I got the conch! You just listen! The first thing we ought to have done was made some shelters down there by the beach. It wasn't half cold down there in the night. But the first time Ralph says fire, you goes holding up and screaming up his hill mountain like a pack of kids. By now they were listening to his tirade. How can you expect to be rescued if you don't put first things first and act proper? He took off his glasses and made as if to put down the conch. But the sudden motion toward the m- most of the older boys changed his mind and he tucked the shell under his arms and he crouched back on the rock. And then you get here and you build a bonfire that ain't no use. And now you done set the whole island on fire. Won't we look funny if the whole island burns up? Cooked fruit, that's what we'll have to eat. And roast pork. And that's nothing to laugh at. And you said Ralph was chief. And you don't give him a time to think. And then when he says something, you rush off like, like. He paused for breath and the fire growled at them. And that's not all. Them kids. Them Letlands. Who took any notice of them? Who knows how many we got? Ralph took a sudden step forward. I told you to! I told you to get the names! Well, how could I? Cried Piggy indignantly. All by myself? They waited for two minutes! And then they fell into the sea and went into the forest and they just scattered everywhere! How was I to know which was which? Ralph licked his pale lips. Then you don't know how many of us there ought to be? How could I with all them letlands running around like insects? And then you three come back and as soon as I said make a fire they all ran away and I never had a chance. That's enough! Said Ralph sharply and snatched back the conch. If you didn't, you didn't! And then you come up here and pinch my specs! Jack turned on him. You shut up! And then Litlins was wandering around down there by where the fire is. How do you know they're still there? Piggy stood up and pointed at the smoke and the flames. A murmur rose among the boys and died away. Something strange was happening to Piggy, for he was gasping for breath. <laughs> and that Litlin gasped Piggy. Him! With a mark on his face! I don't see him! Where is he now? The crowd was silent as death. Him! That talked about the snake! He was down there! A tree exploded in the fire like a bomb. Tall swaths of creepers rose for a moment and into view and agonized and went down again. And the boys screamed at them, Snakes! Look at the snakes! In the west, and unheeded, the sun lay an inch or two above the sea. Their faces were lit redly from beneath. Piggy fell against the rock and clutched it with both his hands. That little one, that had a mark on his face! Where is he now? I tell you, I don't see him. The boys looked at each other fearfully, unbelieving. Where is he now? Ralph muttered the reply as if in shame. But perhaps he went back to the... the... beneath them. On the unfriendly side of the mountain, the drum roll continued. So, 
the rash actions led to a forest fire and the little boy with the mulberry mark on his face that talked about the beastie, the snake thing, is never seen on the island again. We assume at this point that he has perished in the fire. Pretty interesting how I use the reference of the fire to talk about the destruction of the fruit trees near the mountain and symbolize the concept of the Garden of Eden being destroyed by these boys. I think now you can answer the essential question. <laughs>